Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the second half of the course. Uh, well, half, uh, the last four weeks anyway, five weeks. Um, we're going to um, keep going for the next couple of weeks on supervised classification, and then we're going to turn in the la in, and we're going to do two weeks on um, on uh, other types of learning, um, so regression and unsupervised classification, specifically clustering. Um, but before we go there, we're going to take a two-week detour into uh, the field of artificial neural networks, um, sometimes just called neural networks, uh, but it's uh, and sometimes referred to as deep learning. Actually, that's kind of a new new term for it that didn't exist back when I was first studying it. Um, so it's really because of recent developments in artificial neural networks that the the term machine learning and artificial intelligence have become kind of the household words that they are. Um, there was a, a breakthrough um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I forget the exact date, in uh, multi-layer perceptrons um, in the way that they're hooked up um, that suddenly led to um, a vast improvement in their ability to categorize images. Um, and that is uh, the, uh, the use of what's become known as convolution neural networks. Um, we're not going to quite get to convolution neural networks, I'm afraid. We are going to look at the deep learning networks that they're based on. Um, but uh, con the convolution um, network itself is a bit beyond the scope of what we're doing. Um, and uh, SKLearn doesn't actually have built into it a convolution neural network that we can just take off the shelf and use. Um, so because of those reasons, we're not going to specifically look at convolution networks, but they are they are essentially a tweak on multi-layer perceptrons, which is what we're going to... Um, multi-layer perceptrons, sometimes called MLPs, sometimes called deep learning networks. Convolution neural networks are a style of deep learning networks. We're going to build up to multi-layer perceptrons in two steps. Um, we're going to first just talk about uh, perceptrons and the perceptron learning algorithm, and then we're going to uh, make it more complicated by hooking up percep perceptrons to one another and creating an actual network of these artificial neurons, uh, and that's going to be next week. Um, this week we're starting we're starting very simple. The perceptron learning algorithm is simple enough that it's it's pretty easy to understand without very much math. Um, and I'm going to ask you to implement this one too, just like I did with KNN. And then when we move on to multi-layer perceptrons, we'll use SKLearn for that. Of course, SKLearn has a perceptron built into it, uh, which you can run to benchmark against the one that you have created. But I would like you to understand the algorithm well enough that you can create it in code. So <clears throat> the basic idea here is, uh, and there's a real long history to artificial neural networks. Um, you can see the little picture here on the screen. It goes back to... Um, to uh, Rosenblatt uh, in the 50s, I believe, um, who developed this machine, his Mark I perceptron. Um, and the idea is that there's this thing, uh, all, all modern architectures are basically a take on the von Neumann architecture um, of, of, of computers, that is, um, which is that you have a central processing unit and you have it over here and you have a memory over here. And uh, the central processing unit fetches something from memory and then uh, brings it into the processor, does some processing, and then stores the result back in memory. Um, so uh, now we have multiple CPUs um, operating at once on, on most of our machines. Um, but it's still still the, the basic idea is even though there's a little bit of parallelism, you're, there's a distinction between memory and processing. You're fetching from memory uh, into the processor, doing something with it, and then putting the result back in memory. That's the basic cycle, the basic um, instruction cycle. Um, and it leads to this thing that, that um, people sometimes refer to as the von Neumann bottleneck, which is it's this, this pipe between, um, between the memory and the processor um, that slows things down a lot. The fact that you have to fetch and store and fetch and store and fetch and store. And you can really only do one thing at a time um, or maybe up to eight things at a time these days, depending on what you've got inside your uh, machine. Um, and that led to a, a, an interest in... Um, trying to parallelize computation. So there's this whole wave of massively parallel machines with thousands of processors in them um, in the 80s and 90s, um, still going today. A lot of the big uh, weather simulators and um, uh, like simulators of nuclear blasts and things like that are uh, machines with uh, tens of thousands of processors inside them all working together. Um, 
the other side of it too is is in you know yeah there's this bottleneck and maybe if we if we could parallelize things and work on multiple parts of the data all at once we would go faster and at the same time people are kind of looking into what we knew about the brain at, at various moments in the history of computer science and going you know what like if if the brain is doing computation and that's an open question as to whether our thinking can be considered computation or not i mean a lot of people i think the majority of cognitive psychologists and and computer scientists would think that it is some form of computation um, but the you know the jury's out on that um, i think it's fair to say um, but if you look at what's going on in our brain it doesn't look at all like the, the architecture of a modern computer there is no von neumann bottleneck there's not even really any distinction to be seen between processing and memory it seems like our brains consist of something on the order of 10 billion tiny little processing units very dumb on their own that somehow when they're all hooked together um, produce intelligent behavior um, in many cases intelligent behavior that we have that we still have yet to really uh, simulate on a on a standard computer so you know people have sort of looked over the years over the decades to the human brain as like if only we could figure it out sort of how it works maybe we could hook together some kind of an artificial system that mimics a human brain and sort of unlock the key to intelligence um, so uh, this started in, like I said, as early as 1957, um, and uh, the, the first guy, uh, as you can see, made a physical piece of hardware that was supposed to simulate a, a neuron. This, believe it or not, this massive fridge-sized thing, I don't know if you can see the scale, but there's a door handle there um, with tons of wires everywhere. This is before the days of silicon chips and stuff, I think. Um, is, is, to, is to simulate one neuron, you know, which is uh, smaller than the, the point on a pin, you know. Uh, you couldn't even see it with the naked eye. Um, nowadays, when we talk about artificial neural networks, we're not usually talking about hardware. We're just talking about simulations. So we, on a regular von Neumann computer, um, we simulate an artificial neural network. Um, and, um, and, you know, we can, we can create learning systems out of it. We can create... Um, uh, systems that learn uh, and in some cases especially with the advent of convolution networks do um, tasks like image recognition really really well uh, and in some cases better than other approaches so um, if we're going to talk about so what we're going to do is the the very first attempt was to simulate a single neuron a very simplified abstracted neuron called a perceptron uh, and the idea was that it's a it, it perceives things it can classify things in the world um, so we're just going to look at one neuron, one artificial neuron, a perceptron, uh, this week. And we're going to see how it learns, um, what its properties are, uh, what the limits of its learning are, and how to implement it. Um, and then we're going to take a look at hooking them up to, into these multi, multiple layered networks that can uh, that actually remove some of the limitations of a single neuron. So in order to do that, we have to look at, well, what is a neuron anyway? Um, so I've got a little picture here, but I think I have some better pictures right here. So here's sort of an artist's depiction of what a neuron looks like. Now, your brain contains lots of different kinds of neurons in different parts of the brain. The brain has a real structure to it. Um, there are discrete parts within your head um, that have different types of neurons in them and that, and that specialize to do different types of jobs. But here's just sort of an abstract picture of a neuron. So the way a neuron works is, let me just, uh, let's see if I can draw on this. Uh, let's make this black. And maybe a little bit smaller okay so this right here this is your neuron and all this stuff coming out from it now one thing that neurons have in common is that they can receive signals through these things which are called dendrites okay so notice there's a sort of a connection a, a sort of a, a filament coming out which bifurcates splits into lots of little filaments like this this is where it, it connects to other neurons and receives signals and there is there's multiple ones of those on every neuron and you can see some in the background there and then this thing here is called the axon uh, what they're showing here with these um, these little lumps uh, look like sausage links. This is uh, myelin. It's a special um, stuff that coats the outside of the neural fiber uh, and makes signal transmission faster. Um, if you've ever had any experience with babies, um, you can actually, when babies are born, they don't have, their myelination is not complete. They don't have this protective coating fully formed on all of their uh, on all of their axon filaments, and it slows down processing in their brains, and you can see it. 
Uh, like if you ever, if you ever have access to a to a small baby, and I did this with my own children, you know, have them focus on something and then move it. Like uh, and and you know, so a, a person, an adult that you do this with, can right away track it. Um, but you'll see it with a baby. You move it like this. There's like a it waits a second or two, and then it looks over, and then you move it again, and it looks back. Um, it's just they they think slower. Um, and while they're while they're developing, it's kind of cool, and it's all to do with the myelination here. I think, I don't know. Any neuroscientists here? You can you can you can tell me I'm wrong about that, but I think that's part of it. Anyhow, uh, the this is so the axon here is the output. Every neuron essentially has one output, and notice it splits down here into connections. So these little filaments here can connect with the dendrites, which are the input um, to other neurons. Um, and some of those inputs, uh, and what we're what we're passing here is, you can think of it just as electrical signals. It's actually more complicated than that. It's chemical signaling, but uh, the the particles that are being um, sent out from this neuron and brought up, you know, absorbed into other neurons have it, have an electrical charge. And when that charge builds up enough in the body of the neuron, it will fire a pulse. So what you have is these neurons are firing multiple pulses per second. Uh, the other neurons are, are reading those pulses, uh, are, are taking in the input from those pulses, and eventually when things build up enough, they will, they will send out their own pulse. Um, <clears throat> if you want to know what a synapse actually looks like, uh, there's a different picture over here. This is the, a connection. So one of these is, a, is an axon, and one of them is a dendrite. Um, N, so let's call, wait, let me draw on this too. Am I going to have to reconfigure this? Yeah, I am. Um, actually, maybe we should make this one white. Eh, not quite as thick. So I don't know which is which here, but we could say this is the axon, and this here is the dendrite. You can see that they don't actually connect. There's no. It's not like wires that send electrical signals. Um, they send um, uh, neurotransmitters. So these are neurotransmitters. Um, some of them you may have heard of, like serotonin and so on. So a lot of psychoactive dr active drugs uh, affect um, the way that neurotransmitters work and, and change the way that the brain functions based on that. Um, but essentially what's happening in here is the axon will send out neurotransmitters, the dendrite will receive them, and the effect of that will be an increased or a decreased charge. So um, you can have um, synapses that are inhibitory, And you can have, whoops, my pen's not working here, inhibitory. Or you can have uh, synapses that are um, excitatory. I think I might be missing a C there. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so you can have some connections that send kind of a negative charge into the cell. So if, if the axon, let's go back to the other picture. If this axon fires and it goes down an inhibitory connection, it's going to send negative charge into the other neuron, which will cause it to reduce its charge, make it less likely to fire. And there are excitatory signals. If it sends uh, the signal and it goes down and uh, uh, goes to a synapse that's excitatory, um, it will um, increase the charge and make it more likely to fire. So you know you can think of some of these synapses are positive and some of them are negative, and they seem to be have different strengths as well. And it may be just to do with the number of synapses from an axon to a particular dendrite. Um, but uh, one, one neuron can fire and send a strong um, you know, excitatory signal to another neuron. Um, and at the same, uh, or another neuron can fire and send like a weak uh, inhibitory signal. So you can have, you've, you've got strengths of connections here. Uh, and this is where the intelligence seems to be, if it's anywhere. It seems to be between, in the connections, in the huge network of billions upon billions upon billions of connections. Uh, let me just see if I can fix this. Eh, eh, eh. There should be a C there. Um, okay, um, so that's that's the, uh, the what real neurons, that's a, a very, very brief primer. Um, I'm sure any neuroscientists that were listening to this would want to correct me on a million things, but I, I do believe that I've given, in broad strokes, I've given you uh, how real neurons work in the real brain. Now, when you're a computer scientist, um, your your main if if you just have your computer science hat on, then your main goal is to um, produce a better computer program. So you may look to um, uh, neuroscience for uh, inspiration, um, but you may not be too concerned about whether the thing that you end up creating 
um, is could really would really be accepted by neuroscientists as a good simulation. Um, neuroscientists, on the other hand, would be interested in much more detailed simulations, as well as kind of proof of concept stuff. So if you can hook up a if a neuroscientist has a theory about how some part of the brain works, um, if you can hook up a neural network that somewhat mimics that um, and seems to produce similar behavior, then you've kind of got a proof of concept that their theory might be right. Um, that's what a lot of uh, a lot a lot of what goes on in cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience. But if you're just trying to be a computer scientist, then you 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 know you're 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 sort of class casting in one eye at neuroscience and going eh, you know I sort of see how it works. You got a network of things; they're sending signals to one another. Let's try and simulate something like that and see if we can get some good behavior out of it, right? So uh, that's these artificial neural networks should generally be taken with about a, a pound of salt. As far as uh, as far as realistic models goes. Okay, um, yeah. So what's a perceptron? Um, here's a picture one. Okay. So here's our dendrites here. These are our inputs, and here's our axon. We don't really call them dendrites and axons anymore. We just call them uh, um, we just call them inputs and outputs. So this one has four inputs and one output, unlike a real neuron, which would have, you know possibly a thousand inputs or 10,000 or a million inputs and one output. Um, and uh, the connections have a strength. That's the other thing about synapses. Like I said, some of them can be weak and some of them can be strong. So this synapse is strong. It sends, this connection is strong. It sends a lot of charge into the body of the neuron. Um, this one is weaker. And these ones, since they're negative, are inhibitory. So these ones excite the neuron, make it more likely to fire. These ones inhibit the neuron. Sorry, the middle ones here inhibit the neuron, make it less likely to fire. Okay, so, um, uh, so that's the idea. Uh, and in, in the perceptron, we simplify things by making the inputs and outputs 0 and 1. Okay, zeros and 1s. Now, when we go into multilayer perceptrons, we'll, we'll extend that to basically be any, any number here. Um, um, usually between usually numbers between zero and one or negative one and positive one, um, and we have what's called a threshold here. So the idea is that uh, excitement builds up in the neuron until it fires, or builds up and then subsides when inhibitory signals come in, and then builds up and eventually it fires. So firing means uh, a one, and not firing means a zero, and we model that sort of idea that excitement builds up until it fires as a threshold. So that's what T is here. T is a threshold. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out these total strengths of signal coming in. And we do that by multiplying the input with the weight. So this input and this input are going to send in zero signal. They're not going to affect anything. This input's going to send in 1 times negative 0.2, which is negative 0.2. And this one's going to send in 1.6. So that's going to build up to a total, sim, um, to a total activation of 1.4. And if it's higher than the threshold, the output will be a 1, which is why we're showing the 1 here. Okay, so this is the way it's done. Now, this is getting a little bit mathematical here. Uh, we call the inputs x. Um, we call the weights w. So imagine we have a vector of four weights and four inputs. So if you're thinking ahead to how you're going to um, model this, there's an NP array of four weights and an NP array of four inputs. And what you want to do is um, component by component multiply them. So you want to multiply together the weights times the inputs. This weight times, sorry, this weight times this input, this one times this, this one times this. You can do that in one step in, in NumPy. And then you want to sum them all up. Uh, so here it is, 0 times 0 0.3 plus 1 times negative 0.2 plus 0 times negative 0.6 and so on. Gets you a total activation, A, of 1.4. And then you compare it to the threshold, T. And since A is greater than T, the output is 1. Okay. Otherwise, it would have been zero. So if this was a classification task, the inputs here would be features. And again, we're only doing binary right now, but we can easily scale this up later to, uh, to more uh, fully numeric features. To, we can take floats and doubles. But right now, we're just going to take binary features. Um, so the, and, and the output is a classification. It's a binary classifier. So basically, it's going to be either yes in, in, in one class or in the other. So it could be sick versus healthy or spam versus ham, like spam versus not spam email, or whatever. Okay, so that's the, so the classification label is a zero or a one, um, and the inputs are the features. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, let's set up some, uh, some inputs here, zero, one, 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 okay? Uh, now the learning rate, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what that means in a moment. 
um, what's the output going to be right now? Okay, so what we need to do if we want to work out the output of this, we say that the we have to work out the activation first. Activation is equal to uh, zero times zero point three plus uh, one times negative zero point two plus one times negative zero point six plus one times one point six. So that's equal to, uh, this one is just 0, negative 0 0.2 plus negative 0 0.6 plus 1.6, which is equal to 0 0.8, right? So we've got activation greater than threshold. Ah, that's terrible. Activation is greater than the threshold, therefore the output is equal to 1. Okay, so the threshold is 0.6. So the output here is going to be 1. Now, uh, imagine you're training this neural network. Okay, So you're training the network. You, uh, what you, in training, what you do is, uh, let's make a little uh, note over here. So when you're training a network, uh, present each example. Each example. Uh, one at a time, and then uh, check output, and then modify weights and threshold if necessary. I'm uh, abbreviating a little bit here. So the idea here is um, instead of, uh, we're, you know, in, in other um, um, methods of training uh, neural network, uh, sorry, training machine learning systems, we give them the whole set of data. And the decision tree, for example, works with the entire set of data all at once. Neural networks don't do that. You show them one data item at a time. Um, and then you see, did it get this answer right? And if it did, great. Don't need to do anything. If it got the answer wrong for that example, you need to train the network. You need to you need to modify the network. And the idea here is what we'll do is we will modify the weights and maybe the threshold to try and nudge it towards the behavior that we want. Okay. So for this example here, um, let's suppose that the target for this example. So um, so the example here is. Wait. Here's what I'll do. I have a problem with my pen because it's got these buttons on it and I keep pressing it. Um, so example, uh, so we've got these four features, feature one, feature two, feature three, and feature four. This is what our data would look like. And then we've got our target over here. So feature one is zero and the other ones are one. And the target for that, let's just say the target was zero, but the output was one. So that's incorrect. If the output had been zero for this for this example, so this is me presenting the example, this is me working out the activation and then getting the output. If the output had been zero, we would have been fine. We would have moved on to the next example and then uh, presented that example and, uh, to see whether the output was correct or not. But since the output is wrong, what we need to do is we need to train the net. We need to change the weights. So the output is wrong. So uh, what we want is um, the goal in training is make the network uh, more, or the perceptron, likely, more likely to be correct. OK, so what we could do is we could just fix these weights so that it comes out 0. In fact, we could just change them all to 0, and that would work just fine. Um, but that might mess up the other examples. So we have, to think, we have to think about the other examples. And so the idea here is that you just, with each one example, you just nudge it in the direction of getting this example right, and then you go on to the next one. And the hope is that both with all these little nudges, as we go through all the examples, eventually we'll get to the right place. OK, so in this case, we want to make the, um, the, the neuron less likely to fire. So more likely, less likely is kind of a funny way of putting it, but I can't think of a better way to put it. Um, so or make it more reluctant, maybe is a better way to put it. Um, so we want to make it more likely to be correct, which means less likely to output a one, more likely to output a zero. <clears throat> so this is the key um, equation that we have to worry about here. 
So what we want to do is two things. We want to lower the level of, we, we want to make this come out false. Right now it comes out true. Activation is bigger than threshold. So there's two approaches that we can take, and we're going to take both of them. One approach is to lower the amount of activation. So if we, if we make the activation less, then, um, then it's going to be less likely that this is going to be true, and the output's more likely to be what we want. We can also lower the threshold. So what we're going to do in this particular case is we are going to uh, decrease activation and increase the threshold T. Okay? Uh, and when we do that, we do it by the learning rate. Okay, so we have a learning rate of 0.1. Let's make this, let's change that. Let's make this 0 0.05. Okay, we're going to make it a, 0.1 is quite a large learning rate. Uh, and this is a parameter that we have to experiment with, is how, how quickly is learning going to happen? How much are we going to move the, the weights around in order to try and get the best solution here? Um, and what I'll do is there's another, a different example um, in the notes that you can also work through separately on your own um, to see if you understand this. But basically, here's what we do. We look at this and we go, well, who's responsible for the mistake that we just made in this example? Not this guy, because this guy doesn't have any effect on the activation. Zero times whatever is always zero. So no point changing this weight. Leave this weight the way it is. No change to this weight is going to, is going to make uh, is going to is going to get us closer to what we want, which is a zero output here. So instead, uh, we changed only the weights where there was some input, only the weights where there's a one. Um, so I'm going to change this weight. Um, I want to make it less likely to fire. I want to lower the activation. So I need to subtract from this weight. And what I do is I just subtract the learning rate. So this weight here now becomes negative 0 0.25 so it's 0 0.2 negative 0 0.2 minus 0 0.25 minus 0 0.05 subtract the learning rate this one here i also need to change so this becomes negative 0 0.65 and this one i also change i'm going to decrease this one too uh, i'm going to decrease this to 1.55 okay so, uh, so the act these the weights go down, but not all of them. Only the ones where um, it would have made a difference to put the weight down. Okay. Um, now the threshold, on the other hand, goes up because we want to we want to decrease this, and we want to increase this. So the threshold goes up again by the learning rate. So this becomes zero point six five. Okay, and then we we move on to the next example. So whatever the next example is, there's going to be uh, multiple uh, examples here. We're going to move on to the next example and see how it does. We don't even stop to check if it's now getting it right. We just nudged it in the direction we wanted it to go. Um, and then we move on to the next example. And um, you may go through the entire set. Let's say there's 100 examples. You might go through the entire set of examples um, nudging this way and that, nudging the weights around here and there and the threshold up and down um, to try and move things more towards what you want. Um, in order to check whether you've got it right, you're going to have to go through that again. You're going to have to go through all 100 again. So you're going to need to do multiple epochs of training. So um, an epoch, uh, epoch equals uh, one presentation of each example. Okay, and training takes multiple epochs. Okay, and you also have to have, uh, you also need a stopping condition. So how do you know when you should stop? Uh, and there's a number of ways to approach this. I'm going to suggest that when you guys uh, do this, you just go for a set number of epochs. So maybe go for 10 or 50 or 100 epochs. So 10 times through, you're going to present all the examples, and then you're going to do it again and do it again and do it again. So you do it for maybe, maybe do it for 100 epochs. Um, what you'll find is there'll be big changes in the network on, on the first epoch, smaller on the next one, smaller on the next one, and eventually it's going to settle down into a solution that's going to represent the best that it can do. If we take a look, this isn't really the point of this, 
but we could take a quick look. I'll put it in a rainbow pencil to show that you shouldn't take this too seriously. We can we can uh, do uh, the activation again. Um, so imagine it didn't change any further and we went through and we did this example again. It would be uh, zero for the first input plus negative 0 0.25 for the second plus negative 0 0.65 for the third plus 1.55 which is equal to, yikes. So that's negative 0.85. I might need a calculator for this. Negative 8.85. So 1.55 minus, so it's gonna be 0 0.7, I think, right? And the threshold is equal to 0 0.65. So notice it's still outputting a one, okay? So it's still wrong, but notice it's, you know, kind of closer than it was before. Up here, it was we were comparing 0.8 as the activation to 0.6 as the threshold, so there was a difference of 0.2. Now we're much closer. If we nudge it one more time in the in the same direction, it's going to flip over and it's going to start outputting zero. Okay, so the goal here on the first presentation is not to get the answer, not to make it so that it outputs the correct answer, because uh, if you think about that, we're going to be doing it to maybe a hundred different examples. We, if we push it all the way to get example one right, it may be pushing it further away from getting example two right. So we want to do little nudges, little nudges, and eventually it settles down into a set of weights that's going to do the best that it can do um, across all of the examples. Uh, and we, of course, with, as with any task, we shouldn't necessarily expect um, that it's going to um, that it's going to get to 100%. Um, so over here, I go through the learning. Um, oh, and if, if, by the way, if it had been, uh, so sometimes we go in the other direction. Um, so in this case, we raise the threshold because it makes it harder to output one. So in, in this example, it's a slightly different example. It's a different, different example here, um, but it does come out with a one. And so same thing, uh, but we wanted a zero. So we raise the threshold and lower the weights and we ignore the zero inputs. And the learning rate controls how to weight, raise or lower them. Okay, now here's an, another example. Picture it right shows the, the same neuron after those changes. Uh, here's an example that you can model um, the exercise that I'm going to ask you to do on. So here's our data. Okay, so we have uh, two features, F1 and F2. These, uh, and then we have a target or a label. Um, this is example one, this is example two. Okay, so it's really, really simple example, but I want you to go through, but we're going to go through the process here. So this uh, neuron, this, this network looks like this. Uh, let me just save this. Export this to uh, the desktop. We'll call this uh, Perceptron Whiteboard 1. And then I will uh, clear the canvas here. Let me put these things side by side. So uh, the perceptron that's going to work on this, since there are only two features, um, it's going to look much simpler than this. Uh, let's draw it over here. So we're going to have uh, we're going to have the cell body, uh, and we're going to have inputs coming in like this. And it tells you so we have two inputs because we have feature one and feature two, like that. Um, this is the target output here. So that's the output. These are the inputs. Uh, start with weight negative 0 0.5. 0 point, yeah, negative 0 0.05, sorry. That's that weight and that's that weight. Um, so that's drawing the picture of the perceptron. And then to train it, um, we present each example one at a time. So in, see here there's four epochs. Um, and uh, in, in the first epoch, we, we just we present this example here, zero and one. So that leads to, uh, so zero, one. That leads to zero activation. Oh wait, what's the threshold? Well, threshold is zero. So the initial threshold was zero. These were the initial weights. Um, sometimes you start the weights at zero. Sometimes we initialize the weights to small negative numbers. The output for this then is going to be, and the rule, sorry, the rule is, uh, if it's if activation is greater than strictly greater than the threshold, we output a one. That's the rule that we're going with here. So uh, a greater than t 
leads to a one output, a less than or equal to t leads to a zero output. You could go the other way. You could say greater than or equal to and less than, but we'll keep it like this for now. So that's, that's sort of the classification rule. That's the output rule, like that. Um, <clears throat> so the activation here, um, actually, let me uh, erase this here. So we've got a, the first example is 0, 1. The activation 1 times 0, zero so the activation is 0. We just add all that up. Um, so the output has to be 0 because it's less than or equal to the threshold. So that's what we've got here. First example shown, these are the weights. Uh, the threshold is 0. Activation, oh, the learning rate on this, by the way, is 0.1. Um, so the, the activation was 0. The target output was 0. So we're good. We don't do any adjustments. Okay. Then we come in and we do the second example, which is uh, 1, 1, like that. Um, that leads to an activation of, actually, I don't really need this, uh, 1 times negative 0 0.05 plus 1 times that leads to negative 0 0.05. So that's what I'm showing here. That's the activation. And the output is still 0. Uh, because it's less than the uh, activation but the target was one we wanted one so we got a zero we wanted a one so we're going to put the weights up and the threshold down okay so uh, this goes up by 0.1 so from negative 0 0.5 it goes up oh no sorry it's a learning rate of 0 0.05 it goes up to zero and this one here also goes up to point zero point zero five. So that's what's showing in the next row here. So after this row has finished, after we've ended this epoch, we, we put the weights up by point zero five because they were both one. So we put them both up and the threshold goes down. So the threshold, because uh, we want to make it more likely to fire, we want to make it easier for it to fire, negative zero point zero five like that. Um, okay. Uh, and then we go into the next epoch, right? And so then in the next epoch, we're back to uh, zero, 01 here. We now have an activation of 0 0.05 because one times that, which is greater than the threshold. So we actually output, oh, I can't just uh, erase that. When it makes those shapes for me, I can't just erase them. There we go. Um, we now have an output of one, but that's not right. So by fixing on the first epoch, I fixed the weights to try and get this to work, but I broke it for this one coming in on the second epoch. So we're at, we're at this, this part right here, oops, second epoch, first example, and it was correct last time, but it's wrong this time. This time we're outputting a one and we wanted a zero. Okay, so I'm just walking through what's in this table, which means that we have to put the weights down and the threshold up. So on the next uh, walkthrough, um, the threshold goes back down to zero. The weights, uh, sorry, goes back up to zero from negative 0 0.05 to up to point to zero. The weights go down, but remember, not this one, only this one. So this weight goes down because that zero weight changing, it's not going to affect this example. So that goes down to zero. So that leads us to now we're at this line here. Um, we're now going to present one, one, um, and we're going to get it wrong again and so on. So I'll let you walk all the way through that if you want. Um, but it ends up with, actually, maybe we should continue to go through it. Um, so now we're going in here and we're going zero, zero like that, that's a zero. Um, threshold is zero, this is gonna give us a zero output. Activation, uh, zero, output zero, this is incorrect, wrong. So we have to put, um, sorry, I got this wrong here, this, is, this should be um, one, one here, one, one. That's the example. So we're on this example here. The weights are zero. The activation zero. 
the output was zero, which is wrong. We wanted the output of one for this example here. So we put the weights up to 0 0.05. They both go up because they're both one. And we put the activation back down, negative 0 0.05, like that. Let's, we might as well just finish this off. Uh, you can fast forward if you want to. We're now into Epoch 3, example 1. Um, the weights and the threshold are what's shown here. Um, we are entering, this is now 0 again, 1. So the activation is 0 0.05, uh, which means that the threshold is negative 0 0.05. So the output here is going to be 1. Um, we are, yeah, we're here. Uh, we wanted an output of 0, so the weights go down again. So this weight goes down to 0. This one doesn't change. The threshold goes up, so the threshold becomes 0 again, because it was at negative 0.05. Uh, I wrecked my arrow here. There we go. Um, and now we go into this example here. Okay, so uh, this now we've got both um, examples are one. The activation is now is actually again 0 0.05, just like it was last time. It is one times this plus zero times this. Uh, the activation is 0 0.05. The threshold is zero. The output is one. Um, we wanted a one. Aha. So this one is now correct. So we, what we did was in the first epoch, the first one was correct and the second one was wrong. We adjusted the weights. Then they were both wrong and we had to adjust the weights twice in the next epoch. Now we're in the third epoch. We adjusted the weights for the first example, but aha, the second example is correct. So we don't need to make any adjustment here. And then we go into the next epoch. Um, this is going to be a zero. Um, and the activation here is going to be zero, which means that the output is zero, which is correct. So that one's correct too, so we don't make any changes. And then now we are in this example here, the very last row, fourth epoch. This is now a one. The activation is 0 0.05, um, which changes this to a one, which is correct also. And we can stop now. We can stop because we went through an entire epoch and we didn't make any changes. Okay, so this that's one possible stopping condition is if you make it through an entire epoch and you didn't and they all the answers were correct, you didn't need to make any changes, then you can just stop and output the result. So the final result is um, for this is we've got weights of uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.05 and 0, <laughs> 0, and we've got threshold equals 0, and that together, that is our final state of the neural network, okay? So that's the, the final state, and that's what we would send out for testing. So this was the training phase that we would send that up for testing. Okay. I hope you guys made it through all of that. Um, it's not that complicated, but sometimes when I'm doing it, it, it feels like um, feels like it's getting complicated. Uh, and I hope that you can read this table here because I want you to try this yourself now. Okay, let me just save this, uh, export it as uh, Perceptron Whiteboard 2. So this shows the final state of, um, of the Perceptron in example four. Uh, sorry, in, in four. So let me uh, let me write that in here, actually. There we go. I'll export that again. There we go. Save. Yes. Okay. Um, so a couple of quick questions here, which we will debrief next class. How do you know which way to adjust the weights in the threshold? So that's just a basic comprehension question. And another one in Epoch 2, <coughs> example 2, Epoch 2, example 2. Yeah, uh, sorry. So, sorry, it should say example 1, actually. This one here, only one of the weights changed. Only weight 2 changed from here to here. 
why didn't the weight the first weight change why didn't we change the first one so i'm gonna i'll, I'll uh, ask you guys for your answers to those questions in the live class uh, and i'm going to stop here and just leave you with this exercise so it says simulate the perceptron learning algorithm on the data set at the right start the perceptron with all zero weights a threshold of zero and a learning rate this time of 0.1 okay so let me just draw that for you let's draw it together if you look at the data there are four features there are three examples so uh, what i want you to do is create a table that's kind of similar to um, the one that i showed you before the one above here's where your inputs come in um, here's your output the threshold here is zero and each of these weights is also zero so that's your starting point for the perceptron okay so this is exercise five and I want you to track this much the same way that I did here so start with epoch one it's gonna have three presentations if work out the activation figure out the output if it's not equal to the target adjust the weights uh, remember you're not necessarily adjusting all the weights each time and make sure you're going in the right direction so the weights and the threshold have to be adjusted in the correct directions um, so I'll leave you with this and I'm gonna leave it there we, we will take that up in the live class okay so uh, in the live class we'll go over some of this stuff we'll take up this example uh, I'm going to go on in the next video to talk about the perceptron learning algorithm itself and, and also this section here on linear separability, um, some of the properties of this algorithm, what it can and can't learn. Okay, um, so I will pick that up in the next video and I will see you in the live class for the debrief of the exercise.